Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my enormous pleasure to chair the panel, but now I would like to disappoint you. It's not a panel about China per se, but it's, it's a panel about transatlantic cooperation on China. So we do not want to focus what is going on exactly in China, what Xi Jinping is thinking, try to guess what he's thinking about, let's say, Taiwan or even Europe. But we would like to, f uh, to try to answer the question if uh, transatlantic consensus on China, cohesive policy is feasible. So as you see in the title of our panel, we have this kind of the three uh, the, the, and the slogan that was um, presented by U.S. Secretary Antony Blinken the, almost exactly a year ago, it was the 26th of May 12, uh, 2022, that uh, U.S., when it comes to U.S.-China policy, we should invest, align, and compete. It is a U.S. agenda when it comes to China. And frankly speaking, when, when, I th when I'm thinking about EU's policy towards China, it's more or less the same agenda that we would like to invest in our capacities in the EU to be stronger, uh, to have better industrial policy, to be more competitive. We should also cooperate with the, our allies, not only with the United States, but also other countries. And we should compete with China, while also cooperate and treat China as a systemic rival. It is our three-pillar policy. So, uh, without any further ado, I would like to go to our excellent panelists and speakers. We have two speakers from the United States and one from Europe. And uh, I would like to assure you that I will, I'm thinking about asking you very easy questions. And the first one is a very, very easy one. Because um, I would like to ask if we really, it's, a, it's the same question to all of you, if we really need a transatlantic consensus, cooperation on China. Maybe it's better to have different policies, that the US has its own, EU has another one, that we have differences. And of course, I would like to, uh, not, uh, not to ask, uh, answer yes or no, but also explain why it is good to have, which, or we need to have a unity, cooperation, trust and any cooperation on China, why we should or why we should not. So let's start from the Euro Europeans' perspective. Finba, the floor is yours. Thanks, Justina, uh, and thanks for having me at this, this great event. Been a great couple of days. Um, look, I think um, I would uh, say that rather than focusing on, on whether it's uh, uh, you know, necessary to have a, a transatlantic consensus, uh, my opening position would be that it's impossible. Um, I'm based in Brussels. Um, I spend a lot of my time reporting on disunity within Europe on China policy. And I guess my, my initial thought would be that um, how are you supposed to have a transatlantic consensus on, on China whenever we can't even have a European consensus on China? Um, you know, we, I guess, in Europe, um, the China policy s tends to be deliberately ambiguous. Um, and that's a product of having to have something that will, will, will suit both Hungary and Lithuania. Um, and it seems to me a little bit uh, far-fetched to think that there would be a consensus, but that's not to say that there won't be room for, for cooperation. And um, I guess we're seeing in, in recent weeks um, a little bit more um, room for cooperation on areas like de-risking and, and, and so on, the, the sharing of language there. Um, but, you know, in, in Western Europe, uh, I think that there still very much is a, di is a different mentality towards towards China than perhaps what we have in, in the United States and perhaps what you have here in Central uh, and Eastern Europe too. Um, that said, um, I do think things are changing. I think that there are conversations happening uh, in Brussels that probably wouldn't have been happening a few years ago around uh, outbound investment screening, around reducing dependencies, um, uh, and I think that those are, are areas in which we're seeing definite cooperation at the G7 level today in, in, in uh, Japan. Um, so yeah, I think rather than being fixated on, on forging consensus, which I don't think is, is likely at any time in the near future, I suppose uh, the transatlantic partners will have to make do with, with finding these areas of, of, of cooperation instead. Thanks, Finn, but to be honest, I am a, I'm a little bit surprised that you are so, let's say, 
um, pessimistic when it comes to the EU because from my perspective, what we did as the EU in the last few years is a remarkable progress when it comes to the, our policy towards China and our unity when it comes to China. 27 member states, difficult to navigate. But James, th the same question to you. Do we need transatlantic consensus and so why? I, so I need? think cooperation's the right word and whether you're an optimist or a pessimist is just how you say it, right? So if you say it like, oh, cooperation, right? Where you say, hey, we're gonna cooperate, right? So I'm, I'm always the optimist, so we're gonna cooperate. I, I think the United States is going to be uh, an integral partner in the transatlantic response to China. Uh, and uh, if for no other reasons than, and from the US perspective, there's actually real convergence between the Chinese um, and the Russian problem. I mean, we both see them as destabilizing forces in Western Europe, and therefore both of concern to the US. So the first thing I would say the most important is, is this notion of clearly cleaving China and Russia into super pro different problems, like Michael Myers over there and Hannibal Lecter over here. That's just not gonna happen, because first, th there isn't gonna be no pivot to Asia, because there's nothing to pivot. 70% of the US Navy is already in Asia. The, the other 30% is not moving there because you know, it is a global commons, right? 90% of the US Army is in the United States and that's where it's gonna stay and that's important because that allows us to actually pivot in both directions. And so for example, the reason why the American response um, in Ukraine was so robust, both in terms of logistics and, 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 and beefing up security and is because we can flex our army. And our, and our Air Force, it doesn't matter where our Air Force is stationed because they're globally deployable. You can have a wing anywhere in the world and it can go fight anywhere else in the world. And the Space Force, shockingly, is in space. So, um, so the, this notion, this fear is somehow America is going to leave Europe and all of Europe's problems and concerns is, is untrue. The other thing is in many ways, from a US perspective, we see Russia as part of the, of the China problem, that Russia is China's stalking horse in Europe, that, that the Chinese want what Russia wants. They want a Europe that is destabilized, distracted, divided, and weakened. And so the Chinese are the really secretly the biggest cheerleaders for the war in Ukraine. And a defeat for Russia in Ukraine is a defeat for China. Uh, and so that's important to us. And the, the big one that I think is, is really important and is really gonna drive the conversation about cooperation is um, the Chinese brand is down, right? The, the big marquee projects, particularly in Europe, they're dead, right? So Italy's gonna pull out of the Belt and Road I mean, there, there, there really is no more Belt and Road. The northern route is dead. The middle route is really about connecting to Central Asia, not about connecting to China. And we're gonna win the southern route. So this whole Belt and Road idea is complete nonsense. Everybody gets a joke. The X plus one, they don't even call it whatever plus one anymore because nobody's sure who's gonna leave next, right? The, they're, not, they're never even gonna have another meeting. So, so, but the Chinese are not gonna go away from trying to influence um, Western Europe and inc increase not only their inference but the, but the dependence of Europe on that. And, and they're gonna do it two, two ways because Russia has now become such a junior partner of China. Beijing is simply gonna go to the Russians and say this is what I want you to do. So Russia is constantly gonna be an annoyance and irritant to, to, um, to the West regardless of their own ambitions in Europe in the future because the Chinese are gonna use them as a tool. And the other one is the, the Chinese are gonna use whatever influence they have with countries in Western Europe that have strategic dependencies on them to influence that. So there's, so there's two things in the Atlantic community in dealing with China that is gonna be incredibly important in the United States. It's still important to deter Russia as a long-term threat because it's not going anywhere. It's part of the China challenge. And the US is gonna be part of that conversation and part of that commitment. And the other is countries are gonna realize that if you're the last guy in Europe doing business with the Chinese, you're the first door they're gonna knock on to say, hey, you're gonna do this for me. And smart countries, which I think is most of Europe, are gonna be, maybe not how, you know, how can we get all the Chinese restaurants out of here, but, <laughs> but they are gonna say, how can we reduce our strategic dependencies on China? And when they look to that, they're, they're also gonna to look to partnering with the US on some of those things. Wow, it's difficult to summarize um, the, the intervention by, by James. Now I pass the floor to Ivan. What's your opinion? Do we need transatlantic cooperation, unity, cohesion, how we call it? If so, why? <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I appreciate the way you framed the question because if you ask whether we need a consensus, it's implicit that you think we don't have one because if we already had one, then you wouldn't be asking whether we needed one. So I would parse your question into two parts. First, do we have one? 
to which the answer to my question is no, and here I'd associate myself with Finbar. I mean, I think what we have is what I would call a low-hanging consensus. Um, I've been watching transatlantic dialogues and participating in them on China for over a decade. And there's no question, there's been movement in Europe. When I started doing this, it was like the Americans were from Mars, the Europeans were from Venus, we were talking about the Taiwan Strait, the Europeans were all talking about trade, so it's definitely moved. But where it's moved is on things like, as Finbar said, investment screening, common sense export controls, national security and competitiveness related protections on emerging and foundational technology. So that's what I would call the low hanging fruit. And as the bar moves higher, particularly on co-innovation with China, technology partnerships, educational cooperation in STEM, and that is by the way where the United States is going with the trajectory of some of its policy, the bar is gonna rise and it's gonna get harder to find consensus. So what I would say is we have a low hanging consensus, but it hasn't got really hard yet. So then the question is, do we need one? And my answer to that is yes. We do, first, because transatlantic unity is a good thing. We're all Atlanticists here. But second, I would say, since you asked me to be specific, for three reasons. One has to do with China, one has to do with the United States, one has to do with Europe. The one having to do with China just reflects where the Chinese are at, I think, in their strategy. And where they are is they're close students of American domestic politics. If you've watched American debates about China, as Jim knows, over the last seven to 10 years, things have changed quite a bit in attitudes and postures toward China. And so the Chinese, as close students of American domestic politics, know, to be frank about it, that the cake is largely baked in Washington for the next few years. I don't see a lot that's gonna knock the US off this trajectory. And so Chinese strategy is what I would call counter coalition strategy. It's designed to frustrate American efforts in particular functional areas, uh, technology controls, uh, coordination around strategic issues, to frustrate American efforts to build I don't want to call them counter-China coalitions, but coalitions that are designed to make things a little tougher for China. And on that, coming into this year, I think Europe, Industrial East Asia, and Australia were the main Chinese focus. That's where they thought they could get some traction. Um, in the event, for the reasons that Jim said, a lot having to do with Russia, um, China's had less traction in Europe than I think they would have hoped. Um, China will not abandon Russia. Russia will not abandon the war in Ukraine, and therefore they're stuck with this Russian albatross around their neck, and there's no easy way out of that. They've had more traction with Australia. We can talk about that if you want. They've had quite a bit of traction in Asia, and they've had a lot of traction in the global south. Um, but in any case, we need a transatlantic unity first, because if you want to build a coalition and you want to frustrate these Chinese counter-coalitional efforts, more unity is a good thing. Second, there's the question of the United States. Um, I've been working on US-China relations for 25 years. There's been a wholesale change in the last seven or so. And the way I would characterize it is essentially the securitization of almost everything. Uh, economics and security largely proceeded on parallel tracks for a long time. Flows of goods, capital, people, technology, data. These things were happening not because there weren't security differences between the US and China. Taiwan, South China Sea, these are not new issues. And when you talk to people in corporate C-suites or in boardrooms, they were well aware of these issues. But they never impinged on business models. And if you traded stuff, they didn't really impinge on the trade. And what's happened in the last few years is economics and security have basically collapsed together. And what's more, those flows of capital, people, but especially technology and data on the American side are increasingly being refracted through the prism of national security. Technology is especially vulnerable to that because a lot of the emerging and foundational technologies, AI-enabled applications, quantum computing, new synthetic and composite materials, biotechnology, nanotechnology, these things are intrinsically dual use. And for that reason, the more the United States looks at these things as a security issue, not just as commercial public goods, the more the US is gonna use administrative and regulatory instruments to try to attack the flow of these things to China. Um, that being the case, uh, the United States will regard transatlantic unity as making it more effective in that. And that, that brings me to the third. If I'm sitting in Europe, and that's the trajectory of American policy, um, whether I'm comfortable with that or, and I agree with Finbar, uncomfortable with the trajectory of that, um, I would want to influence the direction of that. And to be blunt about it, Europeans are much more likely to do that through a robust conversation with the United States about where that is headed. Ask the Dutch how happy they were about what happened when the United 
United States tried to extraterritorialize its export controls. If the Dutch were so willing, uh, they would have done it years ago. They didn't do it years ago because the U.S. had to basically, A, persuade, B, where they can't persuade is going to try to coerce involuntary compliance with these technology controls. And that being the case, if I were sitting in a European capital, I would want in on that conversation sooner rather than later. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd want to be part of influencing that trajectory. Now, the good news, as I said, is I think the transatlantic conversations come a long way. And if you ask Jake Sullivan or you ask Tony Blinken how they think they're doing, they would probably say that they've gotten a lot of traction and there's been progress in forging what you called more of a unity. But to Finbar's point, I think it's what I call the low-hanging consensus. And as this gets harder, ask yourself, how are European governments going to react if the United States comes around and says, no more co-innovation partnerships in the following six STEM-related subjects? Life sciences, biotechnology, new materials. Are Europeans going to go willingly on that? I think there's going to be a lot of debate to be had. But to circle back to where we started, that's why we need to be forging toward more of you don't have to call it a unity, but a consensus at minimum on the direction of travel and around some of the instruments. So I hope we get more traction than we've had just around the low hanging fruit. Well, so generally speaking, there is a consensus that we should have a consensus that we have a, a low hanging consensus already. So it's a good starting point, but of course it was said by the director yesterday about Ukraine. So I think it's the same story, China, we do not have much time. So I would like to address a question to Finbar, because Finbar is a journalist, a reporter, and you, have a, you, you are based in, in Brussels, and you have, a, on a daily basis, access to the uh, EU's um, officials and member states' representatives. So the first question was pretty general, if we need the consensus. Um, and the second, so my, my question to you is just to focus more on more details. When you have some, when you have conversation meetings with the officials in Brussels, EU officials, but also with the member states' representatives, what's their assessment of the e, uh, U.S. policy towards China? In a sense, what is okay from the EU's perspective? What is maybe not okay in a sense that maybe U.S. is doing something that is detrimental for us, that we should, to some extent. Uh, confront with our interests that maybe are not convergent with, with, the, with the United States interests when it comes to China. So may not, uh, I would like to ask you, you as your, to, 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 about your assessment, but what you hear in Brussels about the U.S. Uh, policy towards China and the impact on us as a EU. Yeah, thanks, Justina, and I appreciate the framing. <laughs> as well, as, as, as a journalist, it's easier for me to relate what other people are saying rather than what I personally think, but I was in Stockholm um, last week for a meeting of the EU's foreign ministers where they were discussing China policy. Um, and there was uh, a paper that was being debated which was steered by, by Josep Borrell, uh, the top diplomat. Um, and there was a line in there that I think captures um, a little bit the European anxieties or some of the European anxieties towards what, what US-China policy is. Uh, I'll just read it out. Um, Coordination with the United States will remain essential. However, the EU should not subscribe to an idea of a zero-sum game whereby there can only be one winner in a binary contest between the US and China. And I mean, that to me sums up a lot of what I hear from officials, particularly in Western Europe and, and from diplomats when we talk about what the US is, is doing vis-a-vis -vis China. I mean, echoed in the Macron comments on the, the flight uh, from Beijing to Guangzhou. Um, they're, they're, you know, in Stockholm, again, I spoke to some folks from the Nordics, I spoke to some folks from the Baltics, and the view was very different. There's less hostility towards what um, what the, the United States is doing. But the very fact that this very specific paragraph <coughs> made it into a heavily edited document that was circulated among the foreign ministers, I guess, was a little bit of an insight into um, where the official thinking is. Um, and. I think when you look at policies like the IRA, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, as, a, as an Irish person, I don't really like calling it the IRA. I, I don't know why Joe Biden decided on that, <laughs> that language. I, exactly, Irish Joe. Um, but, uh, you know, and he, I'm old enough to remember AUKUS um, a couple of years ago now. I mean, it seems as though these, um, these policy moves from the United States um, remind um, 
there, there was a, a panel yesterday on US foreign policy, actually, and somebody described the Biden foreign policy as American, America first for the, for the middle class. And I think that's how, how some people in Europe see that, and it's a reminder that there's an election coming up in, in, uh, in the United States next year. And so when they see these quite unilateral policies which, on which Europeans have not been consulted, there's, there's a bit of a reluctance to, to think maybe we shouldn't go all in with the United States, and I think that's a fairly deep-lying anxiety. There's frustration as well, and I think this is uh, directed at both the US and China, that, um, that, that, that almost sometimes they're talking through Europe. I mean, I had a, a, the chance to interview the Chinese ambassador to the European Union last year, shortly after he arrived in Brussels, and about 10 questions into the interview, I said to him, um, Ambassador, uh, you've, I've not asked you a single question about the United States, but you keep answering with regard to the United States. Uh, do you not think perhaps that the Europeans have come to their own conclusions on China and perhaps that there's a little bit more agency here in, in Europe than you think? Uh, and he, he shook his head, he, he didn't agree, of course. But there, I think that there's frustration maybe in, in Brussels sometimes that uh, the debate uh, on areas that affect Europe isn't really involving Europe uh, for, for, from both sides. Um, but look, um, I, I do think that in general, um, as, as Evan said, when, I, when I've had the chance to speak with US officials, I mean, they're, they're pretty pleased with the direction of travel, even if they're not convinced about uh, alignment at the moment. Um, th there is a sense that, um, particularly after the von der Leyen speech um, and, and the message that she delivered in Beijing, that there's more common ground than perhaps you would think if you, if you only read the stories about Macron's um, trip to China, etc. So those deep-lying, deep-rooted anxieties considered, uh, I do think in, uh, that, that Europe is moving generally in the same direction, particularly on issues like economic security. Oh, thanks, Finbar. So we have the, um, the, the list of some kind of, uh, let's say, problems that we see as a EU when it comes to US policy towards China, um, that we are not consulted that we are, when it comes to inf in Inflation Reductions Act. I think also CHIPS Act, the same story to some extent. Frustration that the US and China are um, talking to Europe uh, or use with the, within Europe, through Europe. So the question is to James and also to Ivan about this, like um, um, your assessment of the EU's China policy, bearing in mind that there is a huge progress, I will focus on that uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few years and also uh, months after this speech, also since the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think that we are more tough on China and focusing mostly on this systemic rival part from these three pillars. And so I will want to ask you about your assessment, what we are doing uh, uh, wrong from your perspective, we are doing right. Maybe we have some kind of good practices, I know tr uh, Trade and Technology Council, but also if I may, as a second, a second part of the, of the question, how you uh, respond to those frustrations from the, from the EU uh, pers uh, perspective when it comes to yeah, US you know, policy towards China? I, I actually think the most helpful thing I can do is describe the root of the problem of why the consensus that we're on is an inevitable path to the future. And a lot of this has to do with the thing that we, ironically, that we don't talk about, which is, well, what are the Chinese up to? Because the other side gets a vote. And if you look at Chinese behavior, particularly as it's become more aggressive over the last two decades, there's a lot of very consistent trends. One is, let's be honest, the Chinese go where they're getting is easy. They go to the places where they're not actually bumping into a wall, and, and they exploit them. Um, kind of very classic Sun Switzian or whatever his name is. Um, the other thing is, when the Chinese come up against an obstacle, they tend to say, oh, well, there's an obstacle here, I'm just gonna go home. No, what they tend to do is get very creative and flexive and adaptive and to seeing out if there's a different way to do this. So in the US, for example, you know, we, we recognize Confucius Institutes, we shut them down. The, the Chinese just go back and say, oh, what are the different ways we can engage with American uh, uh, academic institutions and bypass there? So that's the, that's the concern that we face in coming up with a China policy. And the limitation of, well, we recognize China's a problem, right? But we also kind of need to do business with them, which is kind of 
this is, this is ripe to Chinese exploitation because what you've told them is, oh, I just need to find the right way to work around this and exploit the fact that you still want to do business with me, and I'll end up right where I wanted to. So that's the way the Chinese are coming at this. And, and what I want to say is the biggest, I think the biggest problem in the room, the real thing that really kind of is the tension, which it, it doesn't matter what the lessons learned, is energy. And look at it from the US perspective, where we've tied ourselves in knot. You know, you're, you're exactly right. The trend in America policy towards uh, China is to take China seriously as a serious strategic threat and to kind of take economic and social and, and, and military policies and kind of fuse them together and say, we have to have a coherent response to this. But yet, let, let's be honest, the strategy of our administration rema remains, compete where we must, but cooperate where we can. And, and holding out this notion that somehow we're gonna find ways to do business with the Chinese on these global problems like climate change, and we're actually gonna increase dependencies on China in some, in some sectors, even as we kind of block them out in others. Um, one, one, I think that's an unworkable strategy, and two is it's utterly not sustainable if a Republican gets elected. If a Republican gets elected president, our energy policies are gonna flip on the dime. And this notion that somehow we have to be nice to China because we need cooperation with them energy, that's out the window. Because the next president's gonna be, I don't care about net zero, I don't care about climate change, I don't care about the Paris Accord, I care about gas and oil, I don't care about EV subsidies. And it's gonna be a dramatically different American energy policy. And that's gonna create some real tensions because as much as Europeans realize that reliable, affordable, dependent energy is really important, they're also kind of strenuously hanging on to the green agenda. And among the things the green agenda does, it increases strategic dependencies on China. So that to me is a real, a real fracture point. And this notion is, I don't think anybody envisions a world, right, like the Cold War, where nobody is doing business with China. But this notion that somehow we can satisfy all our strategic priorities by, by safeguarding ourselves against China, but on the other hand, being deeply engaged in strategic places, in, in strategic sectors with China, that that's sustainable. I, I, just think, I just think it's not, something's gotta break. Ivan, the same question to you about the what assessment of the US policy towards China, what is, what EU is doing wrong, what EU is doing okay, and how to respond to this criticism from the EU when it comes to US-China policy? Well, l let me start where, where Jim ended. So Jim said, you know, the idea that no, nobody's saying we shouldn't do business with China. That's right, because we are doing business with China. I mean, the US-China trade relationship uh, shattered all records last year, notwithstanding the tariffs in place, notwithstanding the fact that China's been closed up for a few years, $700 billion in two-way trade. There's still something like 50, 50 billion actually more, more like 100 billion US FDI stock in China. There's plenty of European FDI stock in China. And there's plenty of Chinese investment in Europe. So notwithstanding the point you made about Italy and the Belt and Road, I mean, the Belt and Road's a branding exercise. That's what it was at the beginning. Basically, anything that involved two-way flows of capital or anything else, the Chinese rebranded it Belt and Road. So a flight from London Heathrow to Chengdu was said, oh, Belt and Road. So frankly, I'm not so interested in whether Maloney and the new Italian government pull out of a Belt and Road Memorandum, which is basically a marketing ploy for China, I'd be more interested in watching the trajectory of two-way investment. And there are plenty of European companies and funds that as China reopens from a self-imposed two and a half to three year lockdown are more than eager to get back and do things in China. And the Chinese, as I said, when I talked about coalition and counter-coalitional strategies, are perfectly content to freeze out American companies and steer contracts in a different direction, okay? So, so there's plenty that's gonna be going on between Europe and China, notwithstanding the hardening of attitudes. Now, um, to your question about how the EU is doing, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't sell the Chinese short. China is a trader, it's a lender, it's a builder, it's an investor. And it's the largest trading partner of something like 126 countries around the world. Um, they're active and there's lots going on and there's gonna continue to be lots going on in Europe. Um, the fact that some European art attitudes from an American perspective, because I'm an American, you're the European, um, that some European attitudes toward China have hardened has to do with several factors. One, like American companies, some of the most enthusiastic European companies are facing a variety of across and behind the border structural challenges in China. Um, this regime uh, in China is trying to reopen the economy but 
you cannot tell me that if Zhu Rongji, the man who took China into the World Trade Organization, was still running the Chinese economy today, we would have the exact same configuration of policies. So that being the case, as with American multinationals, there are European companies that are less embracing and less enthused about doing business in China, and that's affected attitudes. Second is the China counter sanctions strategy, where they chose to sanction a group not just of European parliamentarians, but European parliamentarians across the entire political spectrum from the left to the right. So if you wanted to, from a tactical standpoint, piss off pretty much everybody across the spectrum, rather than concentrating your fire on one end of the spectrum, they chose to go after everybody, which didn't help them. Third, you've had the phenomenon in certain countries, change of government, hardening attitudes, Germany is case number one. It's very clear that Foreign Minister Baerbock, through her speeches, has a different attitude than, than we saw in the Merkel days, and so on and so forth. Um, so the Chinese have done themselves no favors, and there are things that are happening structurally. Having said that, as I said, um, what I sometimes warn people in Washington is that while my impression is that attitudes have hardened here, partly because I spend a lot of time with European companies um, in the private sector side of my life, not the, not the Carnegie Endowment side of my life, um, European policy toward China, harder as it is, has not been wholly securitized, and it definitely has not been Americanized. And so the idea that it stems from the same set of concerns, comes from the same place, is a fantasy. And only in a world of unicorns, rainbows, leprechauns, and fairies do the Americans come out here and say, oh, we're all on the same page. So for all the triumphalism, to go back to connect this question to your first one, I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think Americans need to be realistic. Now, what would I like to see from Europe? I'd like to see a little bit more recognition that some of the security equities actually have global implications and are meaningful. I'd like to see um, a little bit more of an Asia-centric rather than just China-centric approach to the Indo-Pacific. I think European countries could do more, not just with Japan, but with India and Southeast Asians. We're starting to see some of that. The United States increasingly has a holistic strategy. We were talking in the hallway about my former boss, uh, Rich Armitage, former Deputy Secretary of State. You know, Rich used to see, he had this famous phrase. He said, if you want to get China right, you got to get Asia right. And I know what Rich meant by that. He meant you shape China's incentives and disincentives by having a larger regional strategy. But the United States is quite guilty, to be blunt about it, of making every relationship initiative and, and policy in Asia derivative of its approach to China. Europe shouldn't make the same mistake. And so one thing that Europeans could do is have a broader approach to the region that builds out a broader set of relationships. It's not a criticism, it's more of a charge. But I think actually you'd find yourselves to be much more effective with China and probably more useful in terms of a transatlantic unity such as it is uh, if you had a broader set of relationships in the region. Sure, sure, James. So I, I, I think that's a really important I want to gloss over is that American strategy actually should shift to be from how do we you know, push back on China, how do we push back on Russia, how do we push back on Iran, and more about how do we work with our friends and partners. So we could have different views on China, but that's irrelevant if we're actually growing space to safeguard our interests. And so the point about you know, engagement with India and Japan, for example, I think is really important. And because Russia is so weakened now, the, there, are really, there are parts of the world in the post-Soviet space that are really opened up to charting their own way. And there's this enormous opportunity for them to link together and create free and open spaces which aren't about really containing China or containing Russia, but they are limiting the oxygen that those countries have to do really damaging things. And so, for example, with the opportunity to kind of link the high north you know, firmly with um, Sweden and Finland and linking that to the development of a north-south backbone of, of Western Europe, and just the nor real north-south uh, integration, you know, across the three seas initiatives and building out the capacity for free and open Black Sea, linking that to um, the Caucasus and Central Asia for a middle corridor that benefits those people and not just for China, linking that to the Eastern Med and what the Italians are trying to do and stabilizing that area, having a more a stable Middle East with the Abraham Accords, and then linking through the, the Suez Canal to the real connector between Asia and the West, which is going to be um, the Southern Corridor across the Indo-Pacific with emerging partners like India and then Australia and also South Korea and Japan. These are positive, constructive things that have nothing to do with, with you know, combating over how much Chinese FDI you want 
or that require divisions. They do require FDI, they require diplomacy, and they require us to think about Eurasia in a different way. Instead of like this blob that's on the other side, and the more of the blob we own, the safer we are, about creating free and open spaces, and more importantly, linking them together and letting small and middle countries enabling to make their own decisions and choices. And, and honestly, I really believe nobody wants to be a Sri Lanka. Right? Nobody wants to be, people would much rather own their own economies and their own infrastructures and do business with whoever they damn well please and not have a Chinese ambassador walk in and say, well, you can't say that. And so I think the, the, the opportunity that Europeans and Americans have to work together in these partnerships is so important and so positive and constructive. We ought to spend a lot more time focusing on that. I mean, not that it's not important to argue about what do we do to keep China out of our you know, colleges, but but we're missing out on the positive, constructive opportunities that are really there. I think Three Cs to me actually is a, a, a penultimate example of the kind of project that we all ought to be jumping behind. Well, uh, Fimba, to, to, uh, I will just pass the floor to you because to be honest, you already started to answer my, my question that I haven't a um, chance to ask you about the how to overcome the obstacles and what to do in order to to be to, to narrow the gap when it comes to EU and EU, uh, US perception of policy towards China. So Finba, what about how to, what to do better? What the, what's the expectation also from the EU that um, US could do better and what we could do better to have to, to forge this consensus on China? Sure, uh, can I just pick up on a point that Evan made about uh, the need to be more engaged with Asia, Asia generally before you even start talking about China. I mean, at this Stockholm event that I was at last week, uh, on the Friday was a ministerial meeting to discuss China policy. On the Saturday was a forum of Indo-Pacific ministers who had flown in from uh, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Korea, Japan. Now, there were 25 European foreign ministers there on the Friday and only 14 stayed for the Saturday. To me, that was a bit of a, 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 a sort of a barometer as to how much they, they care about the region. Are you willing to stay in Sweden? Which is a nice place to be. You know, it's not like they were stuck in, you know, in somewhere that wasn't very pleasant. But it was, a, it was a sign of how the lack of seriousness, I suppose, about engaging with the region. Um, uh, and yeah, I, w I would fully agree with what you're saying on that front. And uh, I mean, talk about obstacles and overcoming ob obstacles and perhaps the potential to, to do more work together. I would echo uh, the point that, that Jim made. Um, I mean, I think that uh, the United States' best ally in this is probably the Chinese themselves, uh, the Chinese government. Um, I think that a lot of the policy shifts and a lot of the attitudinal shifts in Europe over the past few years have potentially, pr probably not been down to, to what's happening in, in Washington, but more the actions of the Chinese government. Um, if you look at the, um, the behavior, say the coercion of, of Lithuania, the uh, Chinese uh, tacit support for, for Russia, um, and even like if you speak to European diplomats who were based in China during the pandemic and they all talk about how they, they were basically faced with contraventions of the Vienna Convention because they were stuck in hotels in some back street in a, in a, Chi in a Chinese um, uh, third tier city for a couple of weeks w without diplomatic protocol being followed. And these people are now back formulating policy in European capitals. Um, I think that's actually a very important factor as well, that the, the learning that they've had from direct engagements with China. Um, we had the Chinese envoy for Eurasia in Ukraine yesterday, Li Hui. He's actually here in Warsaw today, but I think that the message that he seems to be delivering there in 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 Kiev is that China's basically only, only willing to work with Xi Jinping's 12-point position paper. That's also important learning. Uh, any optimism that perhaps China's acting positively on that will perhaps be diminished by that. So I think in terms of uh, overcoming obstacles, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I spoke to one um, one US uh, official recently and his, his sense was, look, we don't, w obviously we are, they are doing a lot of cajoling and they are doing a lot of, 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 of encouraging Europe to do certain things, but in some instances, the best thing they can do is take their foot off the off the throat and, and allow China to, to basically continue what it's doing and, and hope that Europeans' attitudes will, will change as a result. And I think if, in, if that is indeed the case, and if parts of Europe come to their own conclusions, then it's going to be a far, la far more lasting consensus, so to speak, rather than if you're if you're forced to do something because because Washington keeps cracking the whip. 
So, yeah, I mean, I think the major event we saw in EU-China policy in the last couple of months was the von der Leyen speech in, in Brussels at the end of March. To me, that looked as though it was an attempt for, for Europe to sort of define its own red lines. Um, this, is, this is where we want our thinking to be, certainly from the Commission, and, and we know that von der Leyen's quite, quite friendly with the Biden administration, but, but, but I do think that was an important moment in time, a line in the sand, where it's like, okay, she's putting it out there, this is where, where we want Europe to be, and you know, we've seen that China has essentially dominated the debate since then, so it's, it's, it's there, it's being discussed more than ever. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think that, that in time probably we will see a sort of growing, um, I don't want to use the term consensus, but certainly a sharing of, of, of views and opinions. Finba, I would like to ask you a follow-up question referring to what Evan said about the securitization of our policy towards China, because you, you said that I think oh, this, sorry. yeah, yeah, I know that American policy is focused on the securitization. Is there any possibility of the securitization of the EU's policy towards China, as we are mo mostly strong because of a trade of being the economic power, how to securitize, securitize EU's policy towards China? Yeah, I would say probably not anytime soon. Uh, I mean, a very relevant case study is what happened in Hamburg recently with the Costco uh, Chinese state-owned conglomerate uh, purchasing a share. Trying to purchase, it hasn't happened yet. It looks like it's going to happen at a diminished rate, I mean, a uh, reduced rate now. Um, so this is a Chinese state-owned shipping company trying to buy a stake in, in one of, uh, in Germany's busiest port. It already owns stakes in many of the European ports, Piraeus, it owns whole, lots of them in Spain, Italy, uh, Belgium. Um, and I, re I remember reporting on this story and certain uh, German academics that I sp were speaking to that were very pro-engagement were complaining about the securitization of everything in Germany. And if you compare the German debate to, to what's happening in, in the United States, I mean, they're not, they're not comparable. Um, so I think that's, I suppose, a real life illustration of how far away Europe is from having a securitization of everything. Um, this is, by the way, the, the interesting thing about that was that um, we have this FDI screening um, tools in the, the European Union. Um, this is the only instance that I, I'm pretty sure it's the only instance in which the European Commission has issued uh, a piece of advice to not allow this investment to go through, and a government ignored it. The Germans essentially ignored this, and my sense is that if Germany's not um, heeding these investment rules, where's the incentive for smaller European countries that perhaps don't want to put their head above the parapet, let's say, when dealing with China. So, so that to me is a sort of like an asset, a litmus test for, for where the, the any, there isn't a debate about securitization, but that's the example that shows that there isn't one. Uh, thanks. So I would like to now ask the last uh, question to our, to our speakers. So please, uh, I would like to ask you in the audience just to think about your questions. After the, the last round, I will open the floor. So, so not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> so I would like to ask our American um, speakers about this speech delivered by von der Leyen in the end of, of March. And this new slogan that is pretty you know, popular right now in, in Europe when it comes to our policy towards China about the risking. And you know why I'm asking the question? Because I have an impression that this, this kind of slogan, um, this phrase, the risking is also right now um, uh, uh, used in the United States, that we do not want to talk about decoupling because decoupling, the meaning of the decoupling has a, some negative um, sense. So I would like to ask you about your understanding what the risking means and if it's really the case that the United States also would like to use this phrase instead of decoupling. It will be the last question from my son and then I open the floor to the audience. Ivan. Well, I mean, at a rhetorical level, it certainly had an impact. I mean, if you haven't seen Jake Sullivan's speech at, at Brookings, he used the term de-risking, so there you go. So you can interpret that how you will. One interpretation is that actually they think it's important to forge transatlantic consensus on this stuff, and so adopting the terminology is a useful way to do that. Um, at a practical level, um, you know, what is decoupling? I, I hate the term decoupling, because it implies, at least in the bilateral context, that the United States and China are some kind of couple. All right, and when, when you're a couple, uh, 
When you're a couple, you can get divorced. Uh, but the United States and China are not, in fact, a couple because other countries get a vote here. Um, and if the United States, for example, has to extraterritorialize the application of A, its export controls, B, uh, you know, try to coerce involuntary compliance with certain capital rules, that, that, that's not decoupling. That's coercive, administrative, and regulatory efforts to coerce a certain outcome with China. Um, and that in itself demonstrates to you that other countries matter here. So the US and China are not a couple. So I prefer the term deintegration, or you can call it diversification, you can call it whatever you want. And I mean, if you talk to corporates, that's basically where corporate minds are positioned. It's about, you hear a lot of these terms, you know, resilience, diversification. Um, and that's not surprising, first, because the environment in China's gotten a lot harder, it's harder to get stuff in and out of there, but you know, nobody's bolting for the exits from China right now. It's basically a strategy of diversification. And if you wanna look at how that's gonna play out, the reality, Finbar used to cover supply chain, so I know you know, you really have to get granular on this. It's very industry specific. It's not easy to find easy substitutes for China. I don't know if any of you have been to Shenzhen, but I mean, the city of Shenzhen, if you wanna, you know, pioneer a hardware product, you want to test it, you want to tweak it, you want to do it on a very short production cycle. I'm sorry, there's nowhere on this earth like that city to do that. Um, there's a lot of countries in Asia you can do a supply chain stack. Lots of countries are competing for the crown, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, India. All of them have challenges, okay? This government in India talks about make in India. Uh, the last government, the UPA2 government, the one I worked with when I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State South Asia, they had a national manufacturing policy too that was designed to take manufacturing from 16 to 25% of India's GDP. Guess what? The share of manufacturing in, in India's GDP actually shrank. Why? Because manufacturing, not just about manufacturing, it's about labor policy, it's about land acquisition policy. Those things on factor policies in India have always been challenging. And in some areas, they're either thoroughly unreformed or they're being reformed at the state level because in India's federal structure, a lot of these are state subjects. Vietnam has its challenges, Thailand has its challenges, and so on. So um, China's gonna be part of the picture, which is why I think at a corporate level, people are thinking more about diversification than decoupling. And if you use the term decoupling in a boardroom, people look at you like you're a little bit bananas. But I think rhetorically, and at a macro and strategic level, my interpretation of Jake's speech was that the United States has chosen for whatever reason to associate itself with the von der Leyen approach. And you know, you tell me, you're European, but in the context of European debates, I would think that's a pretty pregnant signal of where the United States would like to see Europe position itself, given what happened with Macron and with others. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think decoupling was a forceful start to this debate, but nobody in the West really has a decoupling st strategy, right? And so the part of the reason why uh, um, her speech was so resonant in Washington is actually I think the U.S. position and the EU position is completely identical. Here's here's the problem, though. I'm not sure the, the Biden position which, because the, the, the strategy of de-risking is, yes, let's reduce our strategic dependency where it's easy. <laughs> like, doing the really painful stuff, this, and, and stuff that might really create serious tensions in the relationship. I, I haven't seen this administration do that. And I actually think the, Amer the, the American politi the political momentum is beyond that, that, that there's, there's appetite for more aggressive de-risking. Um, than the current administration has. And, and therefore, I think if there is a change in administration, that's gonna create some national tensions. And where the real progress is gonna happen is actually, not, no, no offense to the EU, love it, um, is at the national level. And what's really interesting is if we, and tell me if, tell me if I'm wrong here, where we see Europe, individual European nations moving very aggressively to the American position, there's two conditions. One is, the Chinese aren't doing that much business in their country anyway. And the other is, they really want a strong bilateral relationship with the United States. So I think Romania is a good example, right? Romania kicks out Huawei. Huawei wasn't really in to begin with. And Romania is in, has gone all in investing in the bilateral. So those are the, the, the first adopters, the quick movers. Uh, and I actually think it's, it's really gonna, it'll be bottom up. Right, the, the nations are gonna move with policies that are more or less close to the United States, and, and that's, that's really gonna drive where the European consensus winds up in the end. Finbar, about 
the risking versus decoupling? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly a more palatable term in most European capitals. Uh, and my sense is that the reason it's taken on so well, uh, everybody keeps talking about de-risking, is because it's so vague. So you can you can basically make it whatever you want it to be. It's almost like the, you know, the um, I, I used the term earlier, the deliberately ambiguous triptych. Uh, partner, rival, competitor. It's, it feels to me like it's almost like an extension of that in, in Europe, at least. Um, you know, so you can still keep doing almost everything that you're doing with China, except these very specific areas. And von der Leyen was very clear in her speech that most trade, the, the vast, vast majority of trade, is unrisky. Um, so really, as long as you're trying to diversify away from China in very critical commodities that are used in the, good luck with that by the way, lithium and cobalt and these sorts of things. Um, and as long as you're willing to consider not, uh, well, stopping national companies from investing in certain risky uh, sectors in, in the Chinese economy, again, good luck with that because I know that the commission's really struggling to get a, a handle on how do you actually track that capital into China. I mean, inbound's hard enough when you're in a transparent place like Europe, but trying to do that in a black box like China is, it sounds great, but you know, there, there's more to it than, than a slogan. Um, so I think that the, the, the de-risking term has been, has been taken on, but nobody really knows what it means in, in reality. I spoke to somebody who was uh, one of the people responsible for coming up with this, and, the, you know, they've been given a, a, a basically an eight-week lead to come up with an economic security proposal, which will be revealed hopefully next month. And the attitude was, well, look, we can have a we can have a, a, a policy for you tomorrow if all you want is a, an announcement. But these things take a long, long time. So we, we, we'll see. It's certainly the word um, that, that seems to have, have, have been seized on. An example of, of, of the perhaps challenges that, uh, and the different readings that we may have on, on uh, what de-risking exists is after the four ministers discussed and by all accounts, everybody agreed that it was important to, to de-risk, and then the Hungarian, different example, I know hung Hungary's a sort of an outlier, but the Hungarian uh, foreign minister hopped on a plane to Beijing and signed a bunch of cooperation agreements with Huawei just after committing to de-risking. So, <laughs> yeah, well, risk's a subjective term, I suppose, and it depends who you're trying to hedge against. But um, so, so I, I think it's a quite immature debate. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I think that because it's not decoupling, People are happy, happy to subscribe to it, but I don't really think anybody knows what it is. Uh, thanks, Vinba. So, uh, the so now time for questions. Um, um, the, the, the gentleman from this side at the third or the fourth row, I do not see exactly. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Konstantin Eggert. Um, a brief remark and a question. A remark is to Jay. Uh, thanks very much for mentioning Central Asia. I travel to Kazakhstan on a fairly regular basis, and the region, the country and the region are crying out for Western attention and American attention. I think that's very important in the Chinese uh, context, no doubt about that. Question concerns actually uh, Taiwan. I live in Lithuania for the last nine years, and since we had this break with China, the relationship pretty much non-existent. You know, the Gediminas Tower still stands on the hill. The Czechs open direct flights to Taipei, and the beer still tastes the same in the Czech Republic. So my question is first to the American participants, Evan and Jay. Do you think that in the context of this standoff with China, the U.S. could use expanding relations with Taiwan uh, as a pressure point in China? And to, uh, uh, to Finba, uh, do you think there are more European nations in your travels and your conversations that will be prepared to follow the Lithuanian, Romanian, Czech example and enhance relations with Taiwan? Because that does pressure the Chinese. Thank you. So thank you very much. Please be very concise because we have other questions to move. So, so maybe the, the f you try to answer this and then I will pass the floor to Eric. Yeah, so um, the, the more friends Taiwan has, the higher the price point for Chinese intervention. Doesn't mean they won't intervene, but it raises the cost for them of the number of countries that they're gonna annoy and, and have problems with. So I, from a US perspective, the more people that engage with Taiwan, the better. From a European perspective, a really uh, blunt answer is no. I, I don't see great appetite for many European capitals to, you know, go as far as Lithuania, sp certainly not Lithuania, but even, even the Czech Republic has on, on Taiwan. I mean, um, 
just a quick anecdote. When I was in, in Brussels last August, around the time that Nancy Pelosi went to Taipei, uh, most people were on holiday. Brussels shuts down in August. Uh, unfortunately, I was one of the few that had to work, but I was going around the institutions, around the member states, trying to, to get a little bit of a reaction. Not much, really. Uh, the, the, the reaction was incredibly muted. There was a sort of eye roll and the description of the US, uh, or Pelosi in particular, as being provocative. And so when Macron made his statements, uh, I, I wasn't that surprised uh, about Taiwan. This is um, because I don't think that's very far from the thinking in some Western European capitals. Uh, Taiwan's definitely on the debate. Uh, it's in the debate now more than ever. But I think that there still is that. Often people think that it's it's not a European situation to become an, involved in. So I think Macron, for some people, said the quiet bit out loud. Ivan, would like to add something about Taiwan? <laughs> This is a much longer conversation. I, mean, I think I'm not a Chinese communist, but if I was one, I would tell you that the principle, the, 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 the alpha and omega of Chinese policy is basically the injection of ever, level, le, ever greater levels of officiality into interaction with Taiwan. At the unofficial level, they don't like it, but the United States demonstrates Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, weekends, and holidays that it's prepared to do a lot of stuff with Taiwan. The United States and Taiwan just yesterday announced basically a new economic agreement. It's not a bilateral trade agreement because the U.S. Back, you know hasn't we don't do trade agreements anymore. You may have noticed it's back in the Jurassic era when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. We still did trade deals, but um, I think at the unofficial level, there's probably a lot of running room. But the more you inject officiality into that relationship, the more you're going to be straight in the crosshairs with Beijing. And I think Finbar spoke to the appetite for that here in Europe. It's not high. So, uh, Eric, Breitberg, and it would be the last question because we have five minutes left. So please ask Sir to a second question. Thank you. Eric Bratberg, Albright Stonebridge Group. So it seems like there is a trade-off between invest, align, and compete. The U.S. is aligning with partners and allies on security, NATO, AUKUS, but investing at home with the Inflation Reduction Act, not offering any uh, market access. So how do we, you know, how do we avoid this? Does this actually leave Europe more vulnerable, more exposed to China, weaker economically? And how do we build a aligned industrial policy that actually competes together um, against China? And it is the last question. I'm sorry, but we have to have to finish in two, three minutes. I just, America's just discovered the Edsel. But we're not going to build any more of those, right? I mean, I think this was a dead end that uh, of industrial policy that was tried and recognized that whatever we do in the future, we're not going to do more of that. Yeah, I mean, you're asking for co. I mean, Eric used to sit next door to me at the Carnegie. Now, so we've been having this conversation. You're asking for coherence, where I think you're unlikely to find satisfaction. And Europe is not alone. Ask the Koreans what they think about the Inflation Reduction Act. Go ask the Taiwanese how they feel about being essentially, they think, coerced to invest in semiconductor fabs in the United States. Why is that good for jobs in Taiwan? Not so clear to people that run TSMC. So I think the reality is there's going to be friction on some of the economic stuff because of where the political debate is in the United States. How we work our way out of that, carefully. And that's essentially what I see happening on the IRA. There was something out of Seoul yesterday where the Koreans seem to be implying they're going to get some satisfaction on some of the complaints they've had with the administration around the IRA. So I think that stuff will just have to be negotiated. But if you're looking for some grand macro, you're not going to find it. Finbar, the last sentence <laughs> from you. Well, uh, ask me to comment on U.S. industrial policy. <laughs> uh, no, I, I and look, you I think from the when you have some. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm baffled. I'm, I'm at a loss. I'll, oh, I'll leave that to the experts. I see. So first of all, thank you very much. It is an almost pleasure to moderate this session. Extremely interesting um, remarks. So I would like to ask you to join me to thank our excellent panelists and to all. So I would like to end this panel about transatlantic cooperation on China. Thank you. <laughs>